welcome to the MTA Podcast Series, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with recognized industry professionals, and your host, Ed Carlson. Tuesday, July 13th, 2010, and this is the MTA Podcast Series. Today's guest is Jeff Chia. Jeff is the Chief Technical Analyst at Thomson Reuters Americas. He joined Reuters in 2006. He presents and teaches technical analysis and foreign exchange options courses to Thomson Reuters clients. Jeff brings 20 years of financial market research and trading experience to this role. Prior to joining Reuters, Jeff worked as a senior analyst at the Bank of Canada in Ottawa. In that capacity, he served in the Financial Markets Department, the group that is responsible for executing all financial market transactions required to carry out the Bank of Canada mandates. Jeff's work involved daily briefing as well as background, background research ahead of G7 and BIS meetings for senior management and governing council to help better understand the implications of trends and developments in financial markets. Jeff's financial markets experience also includes being a market strategist with Standard & Poor's in Toronto, a foreign exchange trader at Bank of America in Toronto, a derivatives and money market trader at the New Zealand Investment Bank in Singapore, and an economist at the Port of Seattle in the United States. He is a chartered market technician, and his research paper, Risk Reversals Analysis and Evaluation, an Option-Based Sentiment Indicator for the Foreign Exchange Markets, was published in the Journal of Technical Analysis, Issue 63. His book, titled The Fog Index, Recognizing Extremes of Fear or Greed in the Financial Markets, was published in 2010. Jeff Chia graduated from Simon Fraser University in Canada with a Bachelor's of Business Administration degree, a double major in economics and finance. Jeff Chia, welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me, Ed. Yeah, well, we're, we're delighted to have you with us today, and uh, you've got such a varied background. I can't tell you how excited I am to get into all this, but let's start with just a very quick overview of everything Thomson Reuters encompasses, and then if you could kind of go from that big macro view and narrow it down finally to the role that you play at Thomson Reuters. Okay. Well, my role at the firm is a fabulous one because I get to um, use a lot of the uh, tools and technical analysis uh, that I really enjoy um, looking at, talking about, um, and I'm very fortunate in the sense that um, I, I get to do this on a regular basis, uh, uh, communicating with our clients, uh, just basically talking about technical analysis. So um, the talk could be on an educational level. Some of the clients are very new to technical analysis, so I get to promote uh, the profession. Uh, but some of the clients are very uh, well-versed in, in technical analysis, so it's mostly a discussion of what do we see in the marketplace, uh, you know, what are we worried about, um, what the tools to help us monitor risk. So um, it's, it's it's a fun role, so I really enjoy enjoy doing all that. Okay, well, I understand that Thomson Reuters provides all these tools for technicians, but I wasn't aware that they also provided opinion. Is that Did I understand you correctly? Well, I want to be very careful about that. Uh, you are right in pointing that out. Um, Thomson Reuters is very proud um, um, uh, in the sense that um, we try to communicate to the, uh, our clients by saying that we have a very unbiased view. Uh, that That is a, uh, a mission statement of the editorial part of the business. I work for the markets division, and I also want to be very careful and clear that um, – if, if I was to provide an opinion, it's in my opinion and not the firm's opinion. So um, there's a little bit of a um, tricky line to cross, if you, if you will. Um, but I, I try to do my best in terms of making it clear that um, the views I provide is my own and not the firm. Uh-huh. Okay. So um, let's see. How do I say that? Um, Thompson Reuters is not some uh, – Someone that, uh, or something that one would subscribe to for opinion simply for tools. Is that correct? Yes, we look at ourselves as a firm that provides intelligent information. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Um, we provide the tools that would help you okay. make good decisions. Um, so, um, for example, we, um, try to understand the workflow of our clients and we are very good at customizing um, um, information in such a way that it will be information that you would need to perform well for, for the role that uh, you're in. 
Okay. All right. Well, let's let's march on here. Uh, time waits for no man. Um, I'm, I, as I mentioned before, you've got this this very uh, uh, broad and varied background, and I'm very excited to see at what point technical analysis <laughs> comes up. Um, did your work at the Bank of Canada involve technical analysis? Well, that's uh, a very fine line there because, as you know, most central bankers are very research orientated. They are very fundamentally focused. Almost um, had you there, Jeff. I almost. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, technical analysis play a very um, background role in, in a place like that. Um, but having said that, um, the, the, um, I know the Bank of Canada, and I know um, some of the central bankers in the Americas region do talk about technical indicators. We, right? for example, we are very interested in speculative type behavior and how do we know if the market has got to a point where there's excessive speculation. And there are indicators that I would consider to be very technically orientated. So in my role at the Bank of Canada, when I communicate this kind of risk, I try to um, not use a lot of the technical jargon. And I think we as a profession should try and move away from that and talk like what um, – you know, most people would understand. So I would say something like, well, there's, a, there's evidence to suggest that maybe uh, we have a speculative bubble and these are um, the reasons why. Um, so it would be rather than say, you know, this is overboard, oversold, you, you tone down your right. language to something that, that is more fundamentally uh, friendly. Right, right. I understand. That, that makes sense. Well, um, did you get your uh, CMT while you were at the Bank of Canada? Um, I was about to finish my CMT when I joined the Bank of Canada. Um, so it was, I think I was just finishing the, the final part of my paper. So, huh. um, yes, I, I did uh, get it when I was at the Bank of Canada. Okay. W- would you consider the Bank of Canada a, a normal transition or, or a stepping stone for a, a, a technical analyst? I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think. Uh, I, I don't think that that would be the route most technical analysis would take. Okay. But having said that, I uh-huh. think um, uh, it was. It, it is a great place to um, um, have a complete picture of uh, the financial markets. Uh, I strongly recommend if a, in any anyone have an opportunity to work for a public sector like a, a, you know a central bank or, or in the finance department of a treasury um, um, uh, organization um, in the government I, I would encourage you to do that because I think you would look at risk from a different angle from a different perspective and I think you would appreciate risk a lot better than say um, as a trader you might be so focused on the day-to-day um, um, movement in the marketplace that you forget the big picture. So I, I think um, it, it is definitely a, a good place to complete your experiences as, uh, as a financial market participant. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. All right. Well, so you you uh, you were all already well into your technical analysis studies by the time you got to the Bank of Canada. Uh, let's back up one step then. At Standard & Poor's, you were a market strategist. Let's start by telling us, what, what does that mean, or what does it entail to be a market strategist with Standard & Poor's? That is a role where I provide a lot of opinions, and it's a role that um, requires a lot of writing, a lot of um, looking at trade opportunities, and uh, the stuff that I write would be uh, based on a subscription basis, so our clients would buy uh, our uh, thoughts and our opinions about the market. So um, I, I come from a strong foreign exchange background, so I tend to provide a lot of foreign exchange type uh, opinions, like, for example, where the euro is going, or what, you know, across cross trade um, strategies, or option strategies, uh, based on whatever is topical at that time or relevant at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a, how how long were you at Standard and Poor's? I would say a good seven years. So um, it's a good place to. Um, um, transition from a, 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 a trading background to more of a research oriented ground. So um, I, I think the best way um, to to perhaps describe my my career is 
um, I, I made a transition from, say, an uh, 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 economist uh, to a training environment uh, to more of a research environment uh, and a policy environment, and now um, to more of a teaching uh, role, I would, uh, I think it's the best way to describe it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And and so if you were at S and P for seven years, I'm guessing that's when you actually started uh, you, the testing for your CMT. Yes, um, yeah. So uh, okay. that's that's when I um, I actually got interested in CMT uh, when I was a trader, foreign exchange trader at Bank of America, but never got around to um, getting serious about getting the professional designation until I got to uh, Standard and Poor's. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue with Jeff Chia in a moment, but first a reminder that on next week's program, we'll have from Barron's Michael Santoli as our guest. Well, let's let's talk about that uh, that trading experience at Bank of America. Let's see here. You were a foreign exchange trader at Bank of America and a derivatives and money market trader at the New Zealand Bank in Singapore. You know, we, we spoke with Tom DeMarc two weeks ago about the difference between those who trade and those who create trading systems. Can you tell us how a trader, having been one, uh, incorporates technical analysis into their daily routine? Well, at the end of the day, what you have to prove to your boss is um, you are generating uh, more P's than L's, uh, meaning more profits <laughs> than losses. Right. So your your day and your life is very clear cut. There's no um, n- no uh, opaque uh, uh, or discrepancy in how someone could evaluate you. Um, so you have a very strong incentive to um, uh, make a lot of money for for uh, for your desk and. And um, um, you could have, in my opinion, um, um, a very strong fundamental background. But at the end of the day, it, it comes down to timing. Um, is this a good time uh, to buy or sell a currency? And um, um, and how, what kind of risk should I be taking it? And I think, um, and not not to try and downplay the, the fundamental aspect of, of the, the, the thinking behind um, a, 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 a trade, but I, I feel very strongly that this is where technical analysis is, uh, is very, very important and could help uh, in many, many ways because, be, like I said earlier, like we, you could have the right view, but if you put on the trade at a wrong time, um, it's going to be very tough explaining to your boss why you're bringing in the L instead of the P. <laughs> right, right. So you were definitely using technical analysis as a trader, correct? I, I definitely was, yes. Yeah. And and uh, since this was the time before your CMT studies, um, how did you learn technical analysis? Well, a lot of it's um, um, through, um, uh, what should you call it, um, books, through um, colleagues that are using technical analysis. I remember sitting next to a dollar mark trader, and you, you can tell how um, how long ago that was because there's no such thing as a, a dollar mark trade now. It's a euro trade. Um, mm-hmm. But I was very curious about, you know, the, the kind of things that he was using and why he would come up with a, a decision and actually put millions of dollars on the table uh, to make that trade. So I sat close to him and I tried to absorb as much as I can from technical analysis. So I would say I was very, very intrigued uh, um, but by, you know, by colleagues that uh, are using it. And, uh, and it seems strange that, you know, that a lot of times I find the, the, some of these people that use technical analysis don't really want to admit that they're using technical analysis. Uh, oh, no. They will come out and maybe say, well, um, you know, the euro looks strong because of some fundamental reason. But when it comes to the actual trade, the time that they put on their trade um, usually boils down to some sort of technical analysis tools. Um, so as as a, a financial market participant, I'm, I'm not afraid or shy to say that technical analysis um, it's a very valuable tool and one that I think would help um, in a lot of decision making, um, um, the, the decision making process when it comes to making a trade. Technical mm-hmm. analysis certainly mm-hmm. helps. Well, okay. Now, now, this next question may be of interest only to myself, but uh, I, I, I'm really curious if if your exposure to technical analysis didn't come about until you were actually on the trading desk, how does one go about getting that seat on the trading desk? How did you make the move from economist to uh, trader? 
Well, uh, funny that you asked that because I remember, um, you know, this is going back many, many years ago, um, I was very curious about what what is it that people, um, I see these pictures in movies or just uh, magazine covers of people holding phones, uh, two phones in their ears mm-hmm. and <laughs> shouting across the room and I was just kind of curious, what is that job? I mean, that sounds, or looks like fun. Uh, so uh-huh. I did a little bit of research and digging up and, uh, and I thought, oh, that's typically, uh, what a foreign exchange, uh, a person would do. They would scream across the, uh, phone to, uh, talking to two people at the same yeah. time, um, trying to get a bit of NAS price and maybe earn on the spread, but a lot of times it's, um, um, yeah, putting on the trade. So I got a lot more curious and I start, uh, finding out more what, what that job is and how what do I need to do to get that job? And uh, I remember sending resumes to places in the Middle East, and that mm. my girlfriend at that time, who's my wife now, thought, "Oh my God, if if you go to the Middle East, I, I you know, we might have to seriously think about a relationship." But <laughs> I'm glad um, I'm glad we're still married, and uh, um, and um, 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 I just maybe I just got lucky. I um, um, someone out there decided to give me a shot coming from Okinawa background with uh-huh. no training experience and um, um, and just went from there so uh, um, I'm lucky in that sense yeah we Jeff we, we, we're, we're running down to the last few minutes here and I've still got so many questions left give us a quick 30 seconds on uh, how in the world the port of Seattle and uh, Singapore uh, comes into your bio Singapore is a long ways away are, are you uh, actually from Singapore I'm originally from Malaysia, which is very close to right. Singapore, um, okay. and um, the the transition from uh, Seattle to to Singapore um, basically came about because um, I, I was asked if if you're interested in this training job, you need to come to Singapore for that interview. Um, the, the sad thing is, when I got to, uh, for that interview, I didn't get that job. But luckily, um, uh, I managed to get a, a different trading job while I was oh. there. So. Um, so things worked out, um, and I think at that time uh, of my career, it was easy to pack up your bags and move because I remember at that time, I only had one bag of belongings. <laughs> now, if I was to move, uh, I, I would probably need a, a truck or two, right. and I don't think my, my wife would be very uh, um, very happy about another move. We've, we've moved too many times in our career, so I think uh, to keep our marriage sane, I, I think no more moves for the next little while. Uh huh. Um, all right, we we couldn't let you go without talking about some of your writings, and I think we've already come to a, a meeting of the minds that uh, discussion of your paper is probably uh, deserving of far more than the time we can give it here. Uh, but you do have a book out, uh, the Fog Index. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that before we conclude today? Well, um, I I have a very strong opinion about um, trying to have a good way of identifying risk in the marketplace. Um, It is not a book to tell you when to buy or sell, say, IBM or uh, or the euro, um, but it at least highlights situations where we as market participants should be very concerned about the level of risk in the marketplace. So uh, the book essentially highlights uh, a collection of indicators um, that market participants, um, um, if, if they are interested in knowing, is this a good time to leverage up on a trade or if this is a time to consider um, losing all your risk appetite and um, stay on the sideline. So it gives some ideas about gauging the level of risk in the marketplace. Um, And a lot of the ideas came from um, my my time spent at the Bank of Canada because we we tend to view risk from a um, macro perspective, um, and the, the book essentially highlights that. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything you can share uh, about what the uh, fog index is telling us currently in this market? Well, as early as um, March of 2010, um, it was 
clear that um, there is a lot of crazy risk going on in the marketplace. Uh, clear in the sense that we have a lot of uh, concern about what's happening in Europe um, and a lot of concern that this could potentially have a domino type effect. Um, um, people at the central bank would like to call that contagion type risk. Um, so in a situation like that, it is prudent to um, consider um, um, lighting up on risky type trade. The high beta stocks um, should uh, be reduced rather than uh, increased in one's portfolio. Um, so that indicator essentially just tells you how crazy hot the market is or how crazy cold the marketplace is. And there will be, at the extreme, it, it is, uh, it gives market participants an opportunity to take advantage of uh, a good trade. Um, but I want to stress, it, it is, uh, if you're thinking that this book would help you, um, give you the holy grail to um, buy or sell stocks on a daily basis, it, it, it's not a book about that. It, it is a book to help you identify whether you should um, um, be in risky trade or be reducing your risky uh, exposure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Hey, Jeff, uh, it, it's been great having you with us today. It's really fun to take a look at somebody's career uh, the way you've allowed us to do with you today and, and just see the transition and the growth. I, I think that's really neat. Um, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we go? Well, I, I, I really appreciate this opportunity, and uh, I just want to thank you for taking the time to um, uh, do this interview with me. So uh, thank oh. you very much, Ed. Well, no problem. Today's guest has been Reuters Chief Technical Analyst, Jeff Chia. And that wraps up today's MTA podcast. From SeattleTechnicalAdvisors.com, I'm Ed Carlson, together with our uh, recording engineer, Shane Squark, in New York City. Say goodbye, Shane. Goodbye, Shane. Let's keep our stops tight. Good day.